Hi, thank you uh, everyone for coming. Um, I'm Mike O'Malley, I'm at the uh, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center and I'm gonna take a few minutes today to talk about the direct anterior approach using a standard operating room table and only a single assistant. My disclosures, I am a, a consultant for Thompson Surgical and I always think it's necessary giving talks about the direct anterior to say that I perform and recommend uh, the direct anterior approach. So um, obviously there always can be some bias there. I want to give credit to, you know, the, the forefathers of the direct anterior approach. It was originally described in the 1800s uh, by Smith Peterson. Um, Chris Kage was one of the early innovators using this approach for uh, total hip replacement. Joel Matta really revolutionized the approach by using a specialized uh, orthopedic table. My training in the direct anterior was in fellowship um, with Dr. Bill Hozak and Jay Parvizi at the Rothman Institute. But the interest in direct anterior is only increasing. Um, in 2018, the survey of the AUKUS surgeons showed that 40% of um, those polled used the direct anterior for primary hip replacement. You can see that that is a significant increase in, in 10 years. So why is that? Well, there's a lot of benefits to the direct anterior that have been reported, including less pain, shorter hospital stay, less walking aids utilized at three weeks, early normalization of gait, less muscle damage, and certainly abductor preserving compared to uh, other approaches. Really, those surgeons that do the direct anterior can be um, uh, siloed in two different schools. Those that use a specialized table, such as the hand table shown here on the left, or a standard operating room table, often referred to as the tableless uh, anterior approach. If you do direct anterior with a specialized table, there are some benefits. Uh, you're able to um, have probably some increased control of leg positioning because it's attached to this to a, a, a boot with a long long lever arm. Um, it's easy and um, easy to use fluoroscopy, which is also one of the downsides. Is you really need fluoroscopy for leg length and component position. One of other cons include it's, it's quite costly. It's difficult to have good OR efficiency. If you have a day full of hips, two rooms, six hips, you, know, you would need two tables, which again adds to the, to the cost. Um, there's limited ability to test stability. You have to take the uh, clinically test stability. You have to take the boot or, um, off of the table. Uh, and then there's also unique complications that have been described, such as femur fractures and ankle fractures, again, because that foot is in a boot attached to a very long uh, lever arm, and the, that arm is not controlled by the surgeon. In contrast, direct anterior on the standard table, leg length and range of motion can be clinically tested uh, intraoperatively. There's less time to set, up, set the table up, obviously. Everybody has standard operating room tables um, in the hospital. You don't need anyone to specifically run or manipulate the table. That being said, though, you do need somebody to help you manipulate the leg, and that is a, a scrubbed assistant. Uh, you can be very efficient running two rooms full of hips, and you can also easily do bilateral, simultaneous bilateral total hip replacement. My indications to do uh, direct anterior is essentially all primary hip replacement. I do femoral neck fractures that require total hips or hemis through this approach. Most total hip conversions uh, and most revisions are also done in my practice through this approach. All standard total hip uh, replacement indications um, apply. I have a BMI cutoff of 40. There are some unique contraindications in my practice, however. I live in Pittsburgh. We have big patients and patients that have a very large panis that hangs over that incision, I will look at it in the clinic. I'll, I'll lift it up to ensure that, that they don't have uh, skin breakdown or fungal infection. If they have a fungal infection, I will not do it, or they at least have to have it uh, completely treated and, and cleared up before considering it. Uh, other relative contraindications, um, certain retained hardware situations, such as this long, um, side plate with screws. If you have to make an incision uh, that is fairly extensile to remove it, it may be prudent just to 
uh, perform the hip replacement through that incision rather than making a separate anterior approach. In order to do the the direct anterior on a standard operating room table, um, I use a, a bump here with the dimensions uh, listed. This bump is placed just proximal to the um, break in the bed so that the if you do have to extend the leg that they have somewhere uh, to go, you can put the head of the bed extension on the foot side so that for large patients they have uh, plenty of room and their legs or, or feet aren't hanging off uh, the end. If you have the benefit of having a sliding bed, uh, you can move that, shift the bed or slide the bed as far distally as possible. That helps uh, if you ever needed to bring fluoroscopy if that is part of your practice. This is just another example. The, the bump is placed just proximal to that uh, leg break in the bed. The bottom of the bump should sit at the level of the ischium. If you flex the leg up and feel the ischium, the, um, the end of this bump should sit right at that level of the ischium. And again, just another example of a patient that is uh, a little bit tall, you want to place the head of bed extension so their feet aren't hanging off the table. I use a third arm board to functionally widen the table. This allows um, me to abduct the non-operative leg onto this uh, extension and then adduct the operative leg during femoral preparation. This is uh, just a picture of draping. I, for standard total, primary total hip replacements, I do a unilateral uh, prep, just the operative side. Uh, if I'm doing a revision or a simultaneous bilateral, obviously I will prep both legs. This does give a little bit mo more mobility uh, to the operative leg. You can place the operative side under the non-operative leg, um, but for a standard primary total hip replacement, that's not necessary. So in my practice, in order to do a tableless direct anterior approach with a single assistant, uh, I require this Thompson hip system. Uh, now, a little background, when I was in fellowship, every case had a second assistant. They were well trained. They were always, they were used to doing total hip replacements uh, and helping hold the anterior retractor. When I came to fellowship, that was not the case. I had uh, random people who were able to scrub that could help hold, uh, sometimes orderly, sometimes it was a resident. Resident is not very uh, educational for a resident to be on the opposite side of the table holding a hook. Um, some of the orderlies I had were, were big and got sweaty underneath the lights. Uh, they would pull too hard or not pull hard enough, either of which is not ideal. So I had to find uh, something to eliminate the that second assist, and I came across this hip system, and it is safe, it's reliable, it's sturdy, uh, it doesn't sweat, it doesn't pull too hard. Uh, wherever you set the tension, it maintains it, it doesn't fatigue. Um, so it, it's quite easy to use, and we'll show here in a video uh, the setup. So this video, um, while it's loading, the there is a an arm that is placed on the non-operative side, the contralateral side, just and attaches to the bed rail, just underneath the uh, armpit. There is a bar that then goes across the patient, and that is very important to be placed uh, mid-sternum. You don't want it too low, or it gets in the way. Um, the end of the uh, retractor arm should be roughly the same level as you, the same level as your incision. These two arm extensions then move distal. Um, I use a combination of retractors from my implant system as well as from Thompson. There's several different ways that you can hook these retractors to the, the retractor system. Um, if you have your favorite retractor that, that you want to use, I guarantee you there's a way to integrate it and attach it. Uh, I use four 
book attachments here and this location. to the next slide here. Oh, let's go back one. Looks like I'm missing one. <clears throat> there we go. Okay, so this is a picture of the final uh, assembly. Again, it's very important. Um, and to keep the this bar proximal over the sternum and that this end of the bar is roughly the same layer level of your uh, incision just a few surgery steps here um, I the incision that I use is roughly three centimeters lateral and distal to the ASIS I try to stay distal to the hip crease for wound healing issues my incision is roughly eight centimeters um, I find it very important, the leg position during incision, you want the toes facing towards the straight up towards the ceiling. You want to avoid external rotation. If uh, you have a big leg that's externally rotated uh, and you make a standard incision without accounting for that, you will end up too medial and you can end up in the wrong uh, interval. So you want to make sure the toes are held facing the ceiling until you find that tensor and the appropriate interval. And that interval is between the tensor and sartorius. Once you identify the tensor muscle belly, you can split the fascia in line with the femur. You then go subfascial into the um, mid-feet interval. Once there, as shown in the, in the bottom picture, you identify and coagulate the lateral femoral circumflex vessels. I just use the bovi and uh, tonsil, nothing fancy. Here's a picture of my retractor position. So anteriorly, I use a sharp homen um, that attaches to a, a, that a light attaches to. Laterally is another sharp homen that's on the lateral femur right by the vastus ridge. Um, these two retractors are blunt homens that are on the superior and inferior uh, neck. I do a capsulectomy versus a capsulotomy. There's a great paper poster by uh, Brian Curtin at Ortho Carolina that showed no difference in pain or functional outcome if you do a capsulectomy versus a capsulotomy. And I just find it um, better, better visualization if the capsule is gone. Here's just a close-up view showing how uh, well you can see and access the femoral neck and head. My neck cut is based off the intertrochanteric line and intraoperative uh, landmarks. I do not use um, fluoroscopy. I do an insight to napkin ring cut. Once that's removed, the femoral head is removed with a corkscrew on power. Here's a picture of my um, retractor placement for the acetabulum. I want to reiterate all these retractors that are held um, by the, the, the Thompson retractor system, and your, your assistant is free to help suck or, or um, do other things to help uh, progress the case. This retractor anteriorly is the same one, the same anterior wall place that was placed at the anterior wall. It hasn't moved. This is the lateral retractor. It was then placed deeper onto the posterior wall, and this cobra was moved from the superior neck to the uh, teardrop. During reaming, I, ab I adduct the leg to help um, to be able to um, bring my hand in at the appropriate abduction angle for the cup. Um, I use a straight reamer. Obviously, you can use offset, but I don't find it necessary in pretty much every situation. Just a close-up view showing how great exposure uh, you can get of the acetabulum from the anterior approach. For my reaming, I use a straight reamer, but I do use an offset cup impactor for placing the acetabulum. I just find it easier. It certainly um, eliminates any soft tissue or bony impingement that's uh, possible, and you can just worry about placing 
the club cup without pushing against any of the soft tissues. Next, we move to the femur elevation. Um, Thompson provides a, uh, a table mount uh, hook. The mounted the table mount is placed just proximal to the break in the bed. Um, the hook is then placed just proximal to the gluteal sling on the femur, and general superior traction is applied uh, to the hook during femur elevation. And there's a video showing the setup. So this is placed just proximal to the break in the bed. The reason I do that is so if you do drop the legs, um, you still have control of the femur and not anesthesia. I don't want them to uh, drop it too far with too much tension. So I, I if the if the mount is attached to the table, the part that doesn't move, uh, you have control. The hook is placed proximal to the gluteal sling. It should go in nice and easy. If it doesn't, you're not in the right place. For um, for this is uh, my so once the femurs uh, to help elevate the femur, uh, you do have to do some releases, and I release pretty much all of the uh, superior capsule. We start at the anterior bo inside border of the trochanter and slowly release posteriorly. The capsule is released, obturator internus. Uh, is released, and once I get to the posterior border of the femoral neck, I try to elevate the femur. Often, it's, that's all you need, and the femur elevates enough that you can access it and broach. If it if it doesn't, if it's still stiff, you I do release um, piriformis as necessary to elevate the femur. I do not, however, ever release the obturator uh, externus. I find offset broaches much. Um, easier to um, broach the femur. Here's a picture of the femur elevated. This hook is doing most of the work. All the tension uh, is in the hook that is helping to, that's holding the femur elevated. It's providing a base for, you to, to, for the femur to, to sit on and you to broach against. These two retractors are double-pronged hip blades and they're merely retracting the soft tissue. I think this is very important because if you don't have a hook, you're relying on this retractor on the greater trochanter to keep the femur elevated. And in, and in poor osteoporotic bone, that trochanter could become compromised. During broaching, the leg is adducted and externally rotated, as shown here. Again, you can see where that leg is sitting, the non-operative leg is sitting on the um, arm board so that it's not falling off the bed as you adduct the operative leg. This is just to show how easy with an offset brooch, uh, once the femur is elevated, and here's the, the, the offset brooches that I use, they're double offset, you can get in and out of the femur without any soft tissue or bony impingement. You could use a uh, single anterior offset if you want. Uh, I just find this um, more useful in my practice. Here's a, another picture just showing how excellent the femur elevation and exposure can be. Uh, there's the, the femur with the implant in. I think one of the best benefits to the direct anterior on a standard table is the ability to trial um, and test stability. So here is what I do in the operating room. I externally rotate and extend. I flex the hip up, maximally flex, maximally adduct, and internally rotate to show, uh, to, to prove that they're stable anteriorly and posteriorly. You're then also able to um, manually check leg lengths cl or clinically check leg lengths either by the malleoli or um, the heels. Go to the next slide. 
good. So my <clears throat> closure, I use a barb suture for the fascia. Uh, obviously, you want to go back and make sure, prior to this, you want to make sure you have hemostasis and the lateral femoral circumflex vessels aren't bleeding. Uh, 2 o monofilament for subcutaneous, 3 o for subcuticular skin glue, and a silver impregnated uh, waterproof dressing. Post-op protocol, no precautions. Uh, home usually same day or within 24 hours. Aspirin, baby aspirin BID for uh, BVT prophylaxis. And one uh, unique thing is that if patients have a panis uh, or a belly that, that I'm concerned about, I will maintain that um, silver impregnated waterproof dressing for two or three weeks. And so how that works is I send them home with um, an extra one or two dressings. After one week, they'll take it off, um, gently clean the wound, and then put another one on. Um, and I, sometimes they'll do that until they see me in follow-up. That those dressings are, are relatively stiff, and they help splint open the panis. I've also found um, inter-dry to be helpful if the area under there is, is, has a tendency to become moist. You can put inter-dry, and that keeps it um, keeps the area uh, dry, so you don't have any uh, issues with increased moisture. And with that, I've been very successful doing these cases, even in um, heavier patients with a belly. Just want to show a couple challenging case examples to show what's possible through a DA approach in general and specifically on a table with this retractor system. This is a patient I've done recently, hips 25 years old. It's an AML and you can see here that it broke and <clears throat> uh, he was having significant pain. Unfortunately, it wasn't completely broken. so. Uh, distally is well fixed to bone. We did have to do an ETO to get it out. ETOs can be done through the direct anterior approach while also preserving and maintaining uh, muscle planes without destroying muscle. I know some of you look at that cup like me and, and hate it, but um, it was well fixed and functioned great for 25 years. So he was perfectly stable just with a, a new liner. So uh, we went with it. This is a uh, uh, an acute, a relatively subacute periprosthetic fracture after a DA that was done at an outside hospital. Uh, I was able to extend the incision distally and then pit, uh, cable the fracture subvastus, uh, again preserving muscle plane, and then place the modular revision uh, stem to bypass the fracture. This is a woman who had uh, a non-displaced femoral neck fracture that was pinned um, and unfortunately still went on to AVN. And you can see she had some superior lateral escape. The hip center is, is elevated. <clears throat> we did a direct anterior hip, brought the hip center down, used femoral head for autograft um, as, a, as a biologic augment, and um, she did excellent. So even placing augments for primary complex primaries or revision is, is absolutely possible through this approach. And this was a, a very tough case. This was a, a Crow 3 dysplastic in a 56-year-old female. Um, through this approach, we were able to get the hip center down into her native acetabulum. Femoral head was used as autograft, and then a subtrochosteotomy was needed to restore uh, leg links and get the hip uh, reduced. So in conclusion, the direct anterior with the standard operating room uh, table and one assistant is possible uh, with a table-mounted retractor system. Uh, it's cost and OR time efficient. It's safe and reliable and can be used for both primaries and revisions alike. Thank you all for your time. Any questions?